Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Did your wife say she really needs her band to rehearse at night? We remind you that this is the second part of our story today. The first part you will find in the description under this clip. Enjoy watching it. She left without saying goodbye. When I returned from work, my mother was sitting with the children. I decided to take some action. I found an entertainment lawyer. I wanted to sue the band because they weren't paying me royalties. Several of my songs that they recorded were regularly played on college radio and occasionally on major stations. The lawyer agreed that I had grounds for a claim and filed a lawsuit. He said it would cost more than I could get back. The case would cost thousands, and I could probably only count on a couple of hundred at best. I accepted it. I just wanted people to know they promoted the songs as their own, and it annoyed me. I included in the claim the money I invested. I had all the bills, credit card charges, and receipts. I packed up all of Packley's things and put them in a corner in the shed. I prepared for a return and the fight of my life. It only took a couple of days, and she called me from Australia. It was short and not very sweet. Jake, I need money. Things haven't worked out as promised. I don't have any money. Sorry, Packley, I don't have any extra. I just spent the last of my money on a divorce lawyer. What? Don't be stupid. I'm serious, Jake. I need money just for food until we get to Melbourne. Borrow from the guys, I said. Like you said, they don't have any money. You know that. Damn, Jake. I didn't think you'd leave me with no money. I'm not leaving. We'll sort out our finances in court when you get back. With tears in my eyes, I broke the connection. I found out she borrowed money from her parents. It must have been unpleasant. I heard her talking to them on the phone about her big tour and how well the band was doing. Her return was as I expected. She entered, seething with rage. She tried to stay calm for the sake of the girls, but as soon as they went to bed, she exploded. By then, she had learned that all her personal belongings were in the barn. Packley, I warned you before you left. You are not welcome here. Damn, Jake. Don't be like that. I'm sorry about how things turned out. The tour is over. We can go back to our old lives. We'll spend the next month or so in the studio. I don't care. As soon as you get another offer, you'll leave again, and the girls and I will be left here, left to our own devices. Damn, Packley. You've been away for a month, and you've called the girls five or six times, tops. It's because I didn't want to fight with you, not because I didn't want to talk to them. Packley, I think our marriage is over. I can't live like this. I love you, always have, and probably always will, but I can't live like this. So, are you serious? Do you want a divorce? Yes, I'm absolutely serious. So what now? How can this even work? Simple. I want you to move out. I will be seeking full custody of the children. Honestly, you don't want them. How can you say that? They are my children too. I'm not going to leave them. Good luck with that. If you ask them who they want to live with, what do you think they'll say? You've practically abandoned them in the last year. I didn't do anything like that. I tried to build a career and give us all a better future. A better future? Okay, how much did you make in a month away? Where is all that money? We didn't make much money on tour, she said with a shaky voice, her confidence less evident. Just as I thought. I suggest you get a lawyer and get some real advice. For now. I want you to move. Where the hell should I go? Go to Steve. He was always trying to get into your pants. If that hasn't already happened, damn, you're a... I've told you a hundred times that there's nothing between us. But if I have to ask him for a place to stay, that'll probably change. Who cares? This is what you want, so make it official. Oh, for God's sake, Jake, you're acting crazy. There's never been anything between Steve and me other than a little flirting and some nonsense. Just go. I want you to leave tonight. Damn you, Jake. You ruined everything, she hissed desperately. 
This is just the beginning, Pak Lei. It's only going to get worse. She left that night, and it hurt. I was in so much pain that I cried. Things got worse when they heard about my lawsuit. They were scared. Steve and Jerry came to my door, and a violent argument began. It became so loud that neighbors called the police because of their death threats in front of my children. They were issued restraining orders. Pak Lei was more than angry, but she soon realized that this time things weren't going according to her plan. She contacted Social Security in New Zealand and spoke to staff. She now knew she was unlikely to get custody. We even went for a consultation with a family psychologist as a family. Pak Lei looked completely devastated when the psychologist asked the girls who they would like to live with, and they both said me. It was a blow she didn't expect. We went to see a psychologist together, and on the way back home, Pak Lei was so shocked she could barely speak. She was lost in her thoughts during the ride and began to sob quietly. What are we going to do, Jake? I don't want a divorce. I never wanted that. What can I do to fix the situation? Looking at her, I said, the only way I can see for us to get over this is if you step away from the group for a while. Give us time to figure out if there's anything left between us. If I do this, will you drop this stupid lawsuit? No, it's not against you. It's against the band. Those other guys kept promising me that if I financed the record, they'd pay me back as soon as they could. Honey, they all agreed to give you the money as soon as this record deal is signed. We'll have the money. How are you going to make an album while you and I are trying to make things work? There's probably room for both, but the album will change everything. If you sign a contract, they'll want you to tour with them. It'll be part of the contract. They'll want to promote it as hard as they can and take a cut of it. So how can we work this out? We can until you're ready to make family your priority. Do you understand? That's why I'm doing this. We've fallen down your list of priorities, and we can't fix this until we're first again. Damn, this is absurd. You always came first. It doesn't feel that way. Where were you when Hannah had whooping cough? Where were you when Lee fell off the swing at school and sprained her wrist? After swallowing what was obviously going to be a bitter response, she simply sighed. It took a few moments before she answered. There has to be some way we can do both. I could look at the band as a job. A lot of artists have families and normal lives. Why can't we do the same? Because you put the band first. I'm sure other artists really see music as a job and, like normal people, put their family first. But I'm already doing it, I muttered with a contemptuous laugh. Where have you been for the last 12 months? You definitely haven't been to parent-teacher conferences. You haven't been to the doctor. My mom has seen the girls more than you have. I think I spoke too loudly. We forgot that the girls were huddled together in the back. Hannah screamed, please stop, you're scaring us. Pak Lay turned around and grabbed the girls' hands. Sorry, dear. Everything will be okay. No, it won't, mom. You're always on the go. We want you to be close. I saw the confusion on her face. Where should you take me, Pak Lay? I'm staying at Lily's. Can you take me there? This surprised me. Lily had been one of her friends since the girls were in kindergarten. Lily and her husband lived just a few blocks from our house. As she pulled up to the house, she whispered, Can I come over later? Yes, of course. This is still your home. Pakle, I asked you to move so we could take some time off. I want you to honestly evaluate what you want out of life. She got out walked to the back of the car, leaned over, and hugged the girls, which turned into tears as they all hugged. I will come later, she said. We slowly pulled apart, and she said, Jake, I love you. I know we can work this out. I don't want a divorce. I want to be who you want me to be. She actually returned home that afternoon. She spent the day playing with the girls and reading to them. She stayed for dinner and then helped me put them to bed and calm them down. We relaxed together with a glass of wine, the radio playing quietly in the background. How did we get to this point, Jake? I don't know, Pak Lay. It started out fun, but you got carried away. You left us behind. I think you've outgrown us or something. 
Now we're more like an anchor than the wind beneath your wings. But I don't feel that way. I just wanted to do my part. I know you understand. You've been there. You know how I feel. I always wanted to be a respected musician, write songs, record albums. Yeah, well, what I think is that you focused on the end goal and forgot about us. You came at it from the wrong direction. You stole my songs. It was painful. You made me finance everything. I paid not only for your stay, but also for these other losers. Damn, I'm not an idiot, Paclay. I saw in your credit card statements that I didn't pay for your food every time you went to McDonald's or wherever. You can't eat $80 worth of food. She lowered her eyes and blushed. Yeah, you're right. It wasn't right, but we needed songs. I really thought you'd enjoy seeing your work get noticed. They're great songs, but you never asked. You just took them. That's what hurts. You did it in secret. You hoped I would like it because you knew how I would feel about it. That's why you never asked me. Okay, I get it. I screwed up. But is this all an overreaction? Why didn't you talk to the group about this instead of suing? Because I don't like them. I never liked them. I told you that when we first met them. Yeah, I don't understand it. They're good guys. They're idiots. Neither of them can finance anything. The last 12 months have been one big party for them, and all I did was finance it. This took the wind out of her sails. She smiled slightly. Yeah, it's been a wild year. You should know that I didn't sleep with any of them. Yes, they all tried, but I never did. Maybe I'm jealous. I don't know. It's not just your dream, it was my dream too. I put it aside because you and the girls needed me. All I wanted was for you to relate to me with the same respect. Jake, I've got a chance. You know how hard it is to break into the industry. Honey, if we get this record deal, it will be huge. The guy we were talking to said that your song we recorded, Night Sky, could really be a number one hit. Yes, my song. Not yours, not the group's, mine. So what happens now? I don't know, Paclay. I want to try, but only if you put in some effort. Can I stay tonight? No, not tonight. I'm still angry. Maybe it's better if we take a couple of days. I want you to spend time with the girls. They're angry too. They feel abandoned. Fix that first. Things sort of settle down the following week. Paclay spent a lot of time with the girls. She was in the house every day. After many requests, she moved back. The woman I loved and married came out from under the veil. She got up early, cooked breakfast, did all the housework, and when she was home in the evening, dinner was ready. I fell in love with her again. She didn't have any money, so I gave her my bank card, although I kept a close eye on it. I knew that she saw the group and rehearsed almost every day. It didn't bother me. She never talked about them, and I never asked. The bitterness returned when I received notice of the first trial date for my lawsuit against the group. The letter was lying open on the dining room table when I arrived home. Paclay gave me a disgruntled, reproachful look. Dinner passed, and the atmosphere was colder than usual. It's funny how our happiness was so fragile. The tension had slowly built up throughout the evening, simmering just below the surface. Once the girls went to bed, Paclay began, Jake, I'm begging you, please drop this stupid lawsuit. The guys don't have any money. They can't pay you even if you win. Maybe not, but it'll sure as hell make me feel better. But it will destroy the group. We discussed this. We are all ready to return your money. Just give us time. What about a big record deal? We're still working on it. We're really close to concluding it. Well then, maybe you can settle this with me before the trial. Jake, give us a chance. I know we were unfair, and you're right. We took advantage of your generosity. Yeah, and if I drop the lawsuit, these idiots will just forget about it. It's not about you, Paclay. It's about them. They defrauded me. There was never any intention of getting the money back. It was our money, yours, the girls, and mine. 
They were on our vacation. I saw her chew her lips, but she swallowed her answer. Steve was able to get legal help because he was receiving unemployment benefits. Using legal advice, he was able to get the hearing postponed, saying he needed time to gather information. The day I came home from work, I found Pak Lay, Hannah, and Lee all happily dancing in a circle. Pak Lay was singing loudly. She saw me and rushed into my arms. Honey, we made it. We got a record deal. We're on our way to success, a real label. I shared her kiss, that magnificent, goosebump-inducing kiss. Congratulations. Who is the contract with? Flying Nun. Well, actually, Mushroom Records. Flying Nun? Wow. Well, congratulations. When we separated, we were both a little out of breath, breathing slowly. When will you start recording? Oh God, I don't know. We're still working out the details. Oh my God, Jake, this is what I've always wanted. I'm happy for you, Pakley. I really am. The girls joined in the hug, and we all held hands and danced around like witches around a boiling cauldron. We were all tired, and Pakley asked, Can we go out to dinner to celebrate? I nodded. Sure, let's get changed and go. Dinner was fun. I had forgotten how effusive and joyful Pakley could be. She couldn't stop talking about the songs, what order they should be in, what she wanted to change. It was fun listening to her chat, it relieved some of the tension. She was talking about my songs. They were going to record my songs. I sat there chewing my steak, listening to her until I couldn't hold it in any longer. So, you still want to use my songs, huh? She looked at me with a stunned expression. Yes, sure. Well, are you going to ask about my permission to use them? She grumbled, shaking her head. But we already recorded them. You gave us permission. I guess the court will decide that. I still haven't received the original royalties or the loan I gave to the band for the recording. Now we can pay you back, Jake. You'll see. You don't understand, Pakley. You sit here and talk about using them, but you haven't even mentioned that they're still my property. She sighed. Yeah, you're right, Jake. Do you mind if we record your songs? Yes, I object. I never wanted the band to record them in the first place. I will need to get legal advice, but I will try to stop them from using them. You've had months to write your own, she leaned back in her chair. You're kidding me. After all this time, God, Jake, why can't you just be happy? You wanted your money, now you're going to get it. It's not just about the money. I actually don't like what you did with my songs. I always knew what I wanted to do with them. I played them for you. I taught them to you. I didn't expect them to turn into pop songs, damn elevator music. You may not like it, but honey, people like them. They like them just the way they are. I don't care about people. I care about my own opinions as I hear them in my head. She pleaded softly, Jake, please don't ruin this for me. The mood disappeared. Even the girls had sad faces. The evening, which had started off so well with everyone happy, now felt depressed. The drive home was gloomy and cold, as were the next few days. The situation developed quickly. I was invited to a mediation meeting by the group's lawyer. Pak Lay didn't want to talk to me about it, it was all top secret. I met with my lawyer in his office before the session. We discussed what I wanted and developed a strategy. This was all turned upside down when we walked in and saw the band, their lawyer, and the flying nun representatives. It stunned me. I knew Chris Wilson, the label rep, from my days in the scene. He played in a band we once supported. He smiled widely when I walked in and came around the long table to shake my hand. Hey, buddy. Long time no see. Shaking his hand, I said, that's right, brother. It should be at the festival at sunset. He patted my hand as we shook hands. Steve and the other members of the group, including Pakley, looked shocked. We all sat down. The mediator introduced himself and began with a short statement. Welcome, everyone. The reason for this meeting is to see if a solution can be found to the existing lawsuit. 
I think we can all agree that it would be in everyone's best interest if this case did not go to trial. There was a collective nodding of heads. Okay, since we agree on this, let's outline the controversial points. My lawyer voiced my claims. He also added that I was not happy with the band using my songs. I noticed Chris shift uncomfortably as he listened to this. The band's lawyer said, We are prepared to make a payment today to cover existing debts incurred by the band, the initial loan and additional funds invested for additional pressings of albums. We have also added an additional payment for accommodation. My lawyer replied, The issue of royalties remains. We dispute them. There would be no royalties if the band had not recorded and released the album. Sorry, but this is unacceptable. The material in question is protected by copyright. It is the exclusive intellectual property of my client. He wrote the six songs included on this album. We know that the first printing of 2,000 copies was completely sold out. There was another edition of 5,000 albums. We don't know how many of them were sold. The group's lawyer responded, and then the mediator intervened. The discussion turned to sales, and it got pretty heated when Steve stood up and leaned threateningly across the table. You're just in fool, Jake. There wouldn't be any sales if we didn't go out on the road and sell them. The mediator intervened. Chris interrupted, Guys, calm down. I don't think this is going to help us. I don't think the fact that Jake wrote the songs is in question, or his rights to royalties. We need to decide what's a fair amount. My lawyer replied, We think 10% of each song is acceptable. That's kind of the standard in this country. Their retort was swift. We agree on 10% from each album, not from each song. The argument went back and forth, it was getting out of control. The longer it went on, the more heated it became. We paused for separate discussions. My lawyer advised, Jake, I think you should take 10%. I'm not sure we can get to 60%. What if we offer 20%? I asked. But I want to make sure they can't use the songs in the future. He agreed, but added, Judging by the look on Chris's face, I think they'll agree to about 20%, but I'm not sure about the usage of the songs. I think if you accept their offer, you'll be agreeing to their right to record them. Think about it, Jake. It will give you an opportunity for future investment. If they're really good, you could make a lot of money from it. In this case, I completely reject their offer. Wow, you don't want much. I thought you needed money. We do but I don't want them to use my songs. Shaking his head, he sighed and nodded in agreement. Okay, we can try. If the first battle was brutal, when I put forward my demands that they not use my songs in their new album, it reached a new level. An argument broke out at the table, quickly turning into mutual insults, including towards me. The mediator had to call a policeman to separate us. The meeting was closed, and we all left dissatisfied. It definitely made life at home more difficult. Paisley couldn't even look at me, let alone talk to me. My lawyer insisted on a new hearing, which was agreed to. As the trial approached, Paisley approached me. Jake, we'd like to get back to the negotiating table. Chris has spoken to us and he thinks he has an offer that will suit everyone. Chris met me outside the courtroom and led me aside. Bro, can you tell me what this whole thing is all about? Okay. Buddy, honestly, I hate what they did to my songs. I hate that they turned them into pop. They were never meant to be like this. He nodded. Jake, I'm not sure what you thought they sounded like, but brother, it's selling today. This is what people listen to. I believe that with a better recording, this could easily reach number one. We stood in a Mexican standoff, neither of us saying much. Mate, you're not going to win this. Just because you wrote them doesn't mean you can prevent other artists from performing them. We are offering above normal market rates, not only for existing sales, but for all future sales. So what do you suggest I do? He sighed in resignation. Jake, let it go. You will receive quite a large fee. We will also offer to pay your legal fees. All we want is artistic freedom. You will get credit for writing them and, of course, your royalties. I promise. We shook hands, and I walked away, leaving my lawyer to finish it off. I didn't want to see Steve smirk at the conference table. 
I picked up the girls from school and was preparing dinner when Paisley walked in. She smiled at me widely, came over, and hugged me. Thank you, Jake. We all appreciate what you've done for us. Steve said to tell you thank you. Tell him to rot in hell. I don't give a damn. It was after dinner when she broke the news. Jake, I have bad news. Yes? Surprise me. Well, Flying Nun belongs to Mushroom now. They want us to record the album in their studio in Melbourne. And what does that mean? I might be gone for about a month. I had expected this. Are you going to be okay with this? No, actually, no. Look, Packley, I think we can both see that this isn't working. I think you should go your own way, leave me and the girls to sort out our lives. I saw sadness in her eyes. Small, shiny tears flowed from them. Jake, it's only a month. When I get back, we can do something, reunite. No, it's not that simple. After the album is released, they will want you to go on tour and do promotion. You'll be missing for another year. I'm not ready to live like this. They are my children too, Jake. You can't stop me from seeing them. I would never do that. You are their mother. I will never stand in your way. Go and conquer your dragon. I hope that when you're done, you'll have some time for your kids. She wiped her tears and cleared her throat. What about us? Can you wait? No way. I don't wish you harm, but I'm done. I think we should break up and move on. But I don't want to move on. I want my family. I want you. Yes, but not as much as music. We parted ways, at least on reasonable terms, not as lovers, but at least we talked. The day she left was heartbreaking. We tried to explain this to the girls, but they were devastated. It took a few days for them to calm down. At first, Pac Lay called every evening, then it was reduced to every other day, then to once a week. The girls seemed as tired of it all as I was. Pac Lay promised them mountains of gold, but actually delivered little. Some gifts arrived within a couple of weeks. It's true, money can't buy love. We settled into our routine. Mom helped, and luckily the girls liked her. I tried to forget Pac Lay. When she called to talk, I simply handed the phone to the girls. They also quickly lost interest in her. Even Pac Lay, with her blind optimism, could see that she was losing touch with the girls. Music was supposed to be my salvation. All my life, I have loudly proclaimed that music can be a powerful healing force. Now it's time to prove this theory. Every night, after the girls went to bed, I poured my soul into new songs and reworked old ones. It didn't take long before I had what I thought were truly great songs. I liked them. Two months later, Paisley returned from the recording studio. She looked stunningly beautiful, this needs to be said. If anything, she looked more attractive than ever. She had a new short haircut that suited her very well, and she dressed in a more urban style, apparently trying to sell the band's image. The album was presented in Auckland. Paisley offered to pay for my trip, but I decided not to get involved. They held a number of promotional appearances throughout the country. The album was released with great fanfare, images of the band were everywhere, there were interviews on television and radio, and songs were constantly played on the radio. Of course, Paisley was the face of it all on the cover, showcasing her stunning looks and curves. She was the girl every music label would want to have. It was fun for the girls to see their mom everywhere in the media, but it quickly became boring when they didn't hear from her for weeks. Chris was right, it was what people wanted to hear. The top place for the leading track was almost a foregone conclusion. Against this backdrop, they went to Australia for a long tour and promotion. The girls and I settled into our lives. They came out of their despondency, and life gradually became better. Between working and playing music late at night, I was a little lost. It was by chance that, while having lunch at a cafe near the office, I came across an advertisement in the local newspaper. It was a young woman looking for someone to play with. There was a number, so I decided to call. As I listened to the beats, I thought, damn it, man, what are you going to say? I was about to decline when a pleasant voice answered on the other end of the line. Hi, this is Daisy. Oh, um, 
Hi Daisy. My name is Jake. I'm answering your ad in the newspaper about looking for someone to play with. Oh, I see. Where do you live, Jake? In Ango, actually. Great. I live in Broad Meadows. What kind of music do you play? A little bit of everything, probably. And you? Oh, I love alternative, folk, blues, and a little bit of indie. Sounds cool. Would you like to meet one evening? God, I wish I could. I just moved here from Hawks Bay. I was looking for musicians like that. I have two little girls, so it must be after 7.30 unless you want to share dinner with us. Dinner sounds good. I'll bring wine. There will probably be acoustic music. Yeah, sorry, if we do it on the weekend, I have a music room, and we can use the amps. When I told the girls we were having a guest for dinner, they were thrilled. When Daisy arrived, they were even more excited. She was several years younger than me. She may not be a beauty in the usual sense of the word, but she was very attractive. She had a bright, husky voice that seemed to suit her thin frame, one could describe her as petite and boyish, all combined. She came in, shook my hand, threw her guitar on the couch, and gave the girls small, cheap gifts. They played together, building Lego statues while I served dinner. Daisy was talkative, she talked a lot, and the girls liked it. Getting them to go to bed wasn't easy, that's for sure. Calming them down was even more difficult. After they left, Daisy and I settled down to play music. She unzipped the case and pulled out a Baby Taylor acoustic guitar. Oh damn, it was beautiful, made of dark koa and sounded rich and bright. I was almost ashamed to take out my Takhine. We started playing some modern compositions that we both knew. Her voice naturally harmonized with mine, and she sang the second parts beautifully, a fifth higher and an octave higher. Our voices blended so well, this immediately made us both smile. We drank wine until we worked through a few more songs. Jake, you're really good. Are you in a band or something? No, not now. I used to play, but it's difficult with the girls. And you? Actually, I jammed with people, but I was never in a band. As we were playing, she saw my folders sitting on top of my guitar case. What's in the folder? Following her finger, I replied, Oh, nothing special. Just some songs I've been working on. You're writing nothing special? Can I hear them? She asked with a questioning smile. I was pretty proud of them, so I said, Yeah, why not, but they're not that good. I played the first one, and she looked stunned. Wow, I thought you said they weren't very good. Hell, if the rest are as good as this, they're going to be sensational. I played another one, and she leaned in close to see the words and started singing along. It sounded incredible, her natural instinct for not only songs, but also how to fit her voice to mine was perfect. We continued to play, and the wine ran out. Sorry, I only have beer left, if you're interested. She nodded. Yes, that would be nice. I got up to get a beer. When I returned, she was flipping through my other songs. When I sat down, she looked at me in disbelief. Are all these songs yours? Yes, all mine. But these are from that new group. This song, Midnight Wish, plays on the radio all the time. Yes, and, well, you said you weren't in a band or something. Daisy, I wrote these songs a long time ago. My ex-wife is a singer. Wow, damn. Paisley is your ex? Damn it, boy. I pointed to our wedding photos on the wall, and she jumped up to take a closer look. Damn, Jake, I'm playing with a celebrity. No, you're playing with a celebrity ex, but these songs are yours. Yes, just a songwriter. Nothing special. We played all the songs, and she was amazed. When I played the old songs, she shook her head in confusion. It's much cooler than the way they perform them. We put the guitars away and finished our beer. We talked until late at night. She was cheerful and easy to talk to, and without much effort, she got the whole story out of me. I guess I wanted to talk about it. Over the next couple of weeks, Daisy became a frequent visitor to our home. She developed a really good relationship with the girls, they liked having a woman nearby. 
Daisy attended the Polytechnic Institute, where she studied sound engineering. I was a little shocked when she asked, Jake, would you like to speak at MIT? We're having a barbecue on Saturday. When I said I was playing with you, they asked if we could play for them. I responded with an indifferent shrug. Yeah, I guess we could. It would be fun to perform in front of people again. She would come over every night, and we would practice late, getting all the songs right and putting together a playlist. On Friday night, as I dusted off my old sound equipment, I felt a rush of excitement. Everything still worked. I checked all the cables, microphones, and effect pedals. We arrived at the Polytechnic Institute, where we had to play in a small auditorium. Helpers surrounded us as we unloaded and set up the equipment. In the corner, I played background music through the system while we enjoyed our meal. Daisy and I took the stage shortly after, and we started with one of my new songs. The sound was really great, the old equipment worked well. Daisy, a little nervous, took some time to get over her stage fright. Soon her voice soared, and she settled into her rhythm. The song sounded completely different with Daisy. When we performed with Paisley, it was all about her. She had an impressive voice, amazing stage charisma. In short, she stole the stage. She had that star quality and craved the spotlight. Here, Daisy encouraged me to come to the fore and sensually wrapped her voice around mine. Her voice was a harmonious companion. The crowd was excited. They swayed and tapped their feet, singing along to our songs. At the end, we received thunderous applause. As we were served beer after beer, the crowd bombarded us with questions and requests. It was a fun day and the start of something special. As we were about to leave, one of Daisy's students approached the car. Boy, would you be interested in playing at the junction on Sunday? I looked at him, confused. What's the junction? My brother runs the junction hotel, and he's always looking for good acts for Sundays. He usually has a jazz band playing, but he told me he was looking for something different. Daisy gave me a supportive look. What do you think? I asked her. I'd like it, but only if you want it. And here we are, a week later on a Sunday afternoon, playing in the garden bar of the Junction Hotel. The crowd was delighted, many people gathered to listen. I couldn't believe how involved they were. It somehow recharged Daisy and me. I'm usually not that dynamic when I perform, but that day I found a new rhythm. Daisy was into it all too, and we ended up with something special. We moved in unison, it was completely natural and unplanned. The more I moved, the livelier and more extravagant Daisy became. Soon the crowd was up and dancing, and there was a hot little crowd in front of the stage, dancing and swaying to the beat. It was the most amazing performance. To top it all off, the manager invited us to come back. It looked like we had held the crowd longer than any previous act, and we made $500. On the way home, Daisy exclaimed, Wow, what a thrill! Oh God, it was incredible. I've never felt this way before. They were so into us. I dropped her off at home, and she said wistfully, Hey Jake, thanks for letting me be a part of this. I mean, you might not have done it. They weren't interested in me, they were interested in us. You're a great singer, Daisy. Really good. She blew me a kiss. Thanks, Jake. You're a good guy. See you Tuesday night. I'm already looking forward to it. I picked up the girls from their mother on the way. They were full of stories about what they did at grandma's. Our Sunday sessions had become something of a local landmark in Wellington. We gained a small audience, which led to other performances, mainly Sunday lunches, although other opportunities arose as our popularity and reputation grew. After one of the Sunday lunch sets, a guy approached me while Daisy and I were drinking beer. He extended his hand for a handshake. Jake, my name is Grant Stevenson. I'm a Dominion journalist. Could you give me a short interview? Looking at Daisy, I said, yeah, no problem, bro. He laughed. Really, bro? Sorry, kid, just trying to be cool. He laughed again. Come on, it's no big deal. He disappeared for a minute and returned with beer. When he sat down, I said, you know we have a writer, right? No, he said, looking confused. Maybe you could have told me before I went to the bar. 
I thought you would understand. No, I thought writers were a thing of the past. As we took a sip of beer, he said, can you tell me why you only play Silver Dream Express? We don't copy anyone, these are my songs. They copy me. I saw the distrust in his eyes, he seemed to think I was lying. Wait a minute, are you saying you wrote all these songs? That's right, Grant. Check out their discography. You will see that most of them were written by me. He took out his iPad and started scrolling, checking my answers. He nodded, his gaze shifting from disbelief to respect. Can I quote you on these issues? He asked. Certainly. Fine. Well, my column appears in the Saturday edition. Can I take a couple of photos? Daisy and I stood up, guitars in hand, and he took some pictures. This column generated some responses. The most notable one was from Failsafe Records. They were interested in recording with me. We had a meeting where they explained that they are always looking to explore the unknown. They wanted to sign me up, using the Silver Dream's popularity on the charts to promote our records. I mentioned that I didn't have much free time. We agreed on a price, and the deal was done. For a glass of beer, these guys were rebels who loved the idea of giving the music industry boss a hard time. Obviously, I wasn't going to make a lot of money from this, but I was happy that the audience would hear my songs the way they were always meant to be heard. Daisy and I arrived at the studio on Monday morning at 8. By Thursday evening, we were done. Daisy had friends at university who were interested in designing the album cover. The release was a modest event held at the junction, where it all began. Grant came to take photographs and write an article for Dominion. Although the release didn't generate much interest, we did generate some excitement. Radio BFM regularly included us in rotation, and we even got three minutes of TV time. Daisy and I became close friends, and I began to develop romantic feelings. She was beautiful, young, and full of life, and we spent an inordinate amount of time together. The closeness between us made it difficult not to have feelings. I toyed with the idea of a romantic relationship for several weeks and finally found the strength to address it. I was lucky enough to avoid awkwardness. At one of our performances at the junction, we were halfway through the first set when I noticed a very beautiful young girl sitting close to the stage, watching intently. Her gaze didn't move away, and Daisy acknowledged it during the break. Daisy and I were sitting together when the girl slowly walked up to our table. When they parted, Daisy turned to me, blushing and embarrassed. Jake, this is my friend Sabrina. I stood up too, and we hugged. Hi, Sabrina. Nice to meet you. When we all sat down, I asked, and how long have you been together? Daisy chimed in, Jake, I'm sorry I didn't say anything sooner. Sabrina and I were both nervous about it. No one knew. Hey, no need to explain. I understand. No, I'm terribly ashamed. I know I should have trusted you. It just didn't seem like the right moment. I understand. You must feel like I was deceived. No, everything is okay. It would be good to know, but you can trust me. Daisy, I wanted to. Honestly, Sabrina and I decided this week that we have nothing to be ashamed of. We're going to make this public, and we wanted you to be the first to know. I leaned closer, and we hugged. Thank you, Daisy. I appreciate it. She added, almost in a whisper, are we going to be okay? Certainly. I don't care about these things. I'm just glad you found love. We ended our second set with Sabrina and a group of fans dancing in front of the small stage. When we were done, Sabrina came over and helped us pack up. Our friendship changed after that, with any thoughts of romance gone. Daisy and I became fast friends. Sabrina also became a regular guest at our home. Every night when Daisy and I played music, Sabrina would come over and hang out with the girls. It was a perfect match, the girls adored Sabrina. She looked a bit like a little girl, so they got along great. Our happy home was thrown into disarray with Paisley's return. She showed up at home on Saturday morning. I was mowing the lawn, so I didn't notice her at first. It was a hot day, and I was pushing the lawnmower up our steep front lawn. When I got to the top, Paisley was there, arms full of bags. I turned off the lawnmower and took off my headphones. Hi, Paisley, how are you? 
She put down her bags and spread her arms. We hugged tightly. Oh God, this is so good. Jake, you were so missed. Yeah, we missed you too, Paisley. How was the tour? Okay, very good, actually. The crowds were huge. Byron Bay was amazing. Great, glad to hear that, I said. The girls are inside, Paisley said. I helped her with her bags, and we went inside. I think Paisley was shocked by the girls' indifference. She probably expected them to run towards her, but at first, they didn't even recognize her. It was only when she knelt down and spread her arms that they approached, but they walked rather than ran towards her. As soon as they hugged, tears and kisses began, along with exclamations of mom. They then moved to the couch, where Paisley handed out the gifts. She got it right, the gifts were perfect, and the girls were captivated by the new dresses, dolls, makeup kits, and some Legos. They both loved Lego. I prepared dinner while they played together. Listening to the girls begin to open up to Paisley was interesting. It started off slow, they were unsure and awkward. There was some awkwardness in talking too much, as if they were meeting a stranger. By the time we served dinner, they began to feel comfortable enough to speak more freely, stories about school, new friends, what grandparents were doing. It was slow, and as I watched Paisley, I saw the pain on her face. The girls loved her, it was the unconditional love that children give to their parents. There was no doubt about it. However, you cannot leave your children and expect them not to notice or change their attitude towards you. Now their connection with their mother was more like a meeting with an absent relative. Paisley saw it, felt it, and her anguish was so obvious. Her secretive, sad look she gave me showed that she was never one to hide her emotions. She carried her heart in her palm, a real carrion. Over lunch, I tried to help mediate to get the girls to open up. It happened, but slowly. After lunch, the girls ran off to their bedrooms, leaving Paisley and me sitting in silence. This was also awkward, but Paisley was the first to speak. How are you, Jake? Yes, okay, I guess. It was tense. The work takes a lot of time. Yes, I can imagine. What about you, Paisley? How was the tour? With a small shrug, she replied. Actually, it was great. The tour was a success. We were able to establish ourselves and build our reputation. The songs are doing well on the charts. Chris thinks the album might even become a top seller here in New Zealand. Okay, I'm happy for you. Are you really happy? She snorted. It doesn't look like it. I don't know what to tell you, Paisley. Do you want me to jump for joy and bang on the drum? No but I think you're just saying words. Try to be nice. Listen, this damn group destroyed my family and stole my wife. Don't expect me to be happy. I never wanted you to leave. The fact that you could have just walked away from your family, from your daughters that you say you love so much. Her response was a bitter growl. Don't you dare criticize me. I love these girls. If I thought you would accept me, I would have returned sooner. I would have taken breaks, but damn it, Jake, you couldn't even talk to me. I was angry. You chose the group and superficial friends over us. Just like the girls, I feel abandoned. I never abandoned you. If you had worked with me instead of turning everything into a big fight, maybe we could have done things differently. Heck, you could have come and traveled with us. The girls would love to see Australia. They had school. I had work. Not everyone can just pack up and disappear. Some of us have responsibilities. Tears began to fall slowly at first, but as she began to wipe them away, more appeared. Her mascara was running, and her cheeks were smudged and stained black. Hannah came in to show us something she had made. Seeing Paisley crying, she grabbed Paisley's hand and climbed into her lap. Don't cry, Mom. Everything will be fine. Paisley hugged her tightly. Thank you, dear. Thank you. When Lee saw what she had missed, she ran over, jumped onto Paisley's other knee, and the three of them hugged. I need to finish mowing the lawn and putting everything away. I'll leave you so you can talk. When I finished, I was exhausted. Our lawn was not big but steep. 
I removed all the trash and went inside. The three of them were playing on the mat again with Legos and dolls. Paisley jumped up, ran over, and ran into my arms, sweating. Jake, you did an amazing job. The girls are wonderful. Can I see them again tomorrow? No problem. It's still your home too, Paisley. I will never come between you and the girls. I don't want them to become weapons. Thank you, darling. Maybe we could all go to the zoo or something. Should we ride the cable car like we did before? Sorry, I'd like to, but I have work tomorrow. She pouted sadly. Oh, I see. Are you dating someone? I replied mockingly, no, but I have friends. It's normal. I didn't want to intrude. You don't need to tell me. Paisley, I was honest. If I was dating someone, I would tell you. She nodded sadly. Okay, I get it. You don't want to go. It's okay. The girls interrupted before it got awkward. Can we go to the zoo, Dad? Of course, dear. Mom will pick you up around 10, and you will spend the day together. Lee shouted, Hooray! We're going to the zoo. Can Anna come? Paisley looked at me. Who is Anna? This is my friend, Lee sighed as if to say, Why don't you know? Well, if Anna's coming, can Becca come too? Hannah asked. I saw Paisley sag under the pressure. I chimed in, maybe you can just go with your mom, have a fun day, and make some friends next time. They frowned but agreed. Paisley looked at me gratefully before walking away. It was a mix of emotions watching her leave. She looked amazing and still managed to make my heart race. Well, Sunday morning was like a madhouse as the girls ran around trying on the many different outfits Paisley had brought. We ate breakfast and quickly cleaned up before Paisley came to pick them up. Then there was the scramble to pack the equipment into the car for our gig at the junction. Luckily, Daisy and Sabrina came to help. The first set was amazing. The crowd was excited, and we got to experience a couple of new songs I had written. This was their first public performance, and they were received with delight. We had a few drinks during the break and sold a couple of CDs. The atmosphere was fun. Towards the end of the second set, Hannah and Lee ran up and started jumping in front of the stage. They had their faces painted and wore little fairy costumes. I looked up and saw Paisley leaning on the door of the garden bar. She looked stunned. When we finished the performance, Hannah and Lee climbed onto the stage as they often did when their mother brought them to watch. Daisy leaned down and kissed them before Sabrina helped them down, and they ran into her arms. I watched as Paisley looked at Daisy and then at Sabrina. She walked forward slowly and reached for Hannah's hand. Lee grabbed her and pulled her into the small crowd of mostly women dancing in front of the stage. Paisley made contact and danced with them. When Hannah pulled Sabrina to dance with them, I expected Paisley to feel uncomfortable, but she got into the game, and they danced holding hands. When the set ended, I was busy signing and selling some CDs when Paisley walked up. Well, 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 it sounded great, she said. She leaned over and picked up one of the CDs. This is what they should sound like. It's a little cruel, I shrugged. People love it, she laughed at my joke. When did you do all this, she asked, looking at Daisy. Oh, the recording has been ready for months. Daisy, who was finishing tidying up the cables, walked over. Hi, I'm Daisy. I'm a big fan of yours, by the way. They shook hands discreetly and briefly. How long have you been together? Paisley asked. About six months, Daisy answered. Have you finished your tour? Paisley asked sharply. Yes, Daisy replied. I just got back yesterday. Paisley looked at me witheringly, with more than a hint of hostility. You could be honest with me, Jake. Honest about what? She came closer. You said you weren't dating anyone. I saw a tear in her eye as she snorted. I'll leave the girls with you. She left before I could say anything. Wow, Daisy gasped. What flew into her and died? I don't know. All I can think is that she thinks there is something between us. Is there? She snorted contemptuously. Oh, watch out. 
I'm not that bad. Sorry, she laughed playfully. I didn't mean that. You didn't tell her about us. She arrived suddenly yesterday. Sabrina brought the girls with ice cream. It wasn't until Monday evening that Paisley arrived. I brought the girls things that I left in my car. Do you want to stay for dinner? I asked. Will Daisy be here? She replied sharply. Daisy and I are just friends, nothing more. She'll be here tomorrow night for rehearsal. Just friends, huh? Daisy said. Damn, Jake, I saw you yesterday. Don't tell me there's nothing between you two. Are you saying you're sleeping with Steve and Jerry? What? No. Why are you bringing up this rubbish again? Well, that's what you just accused me of. God, Jake, I don't even like Steve, let alone Jerry. There was never anything between us. It's probably different for Daisy and me. We like each other, but I don't think her friend Sabrina would like it if there was something between us. Girlfriend? Yes, Daisy loves girls. The girl Hannah danced with his Daisy's partner. She wilted a little. Oh, damn. Sorry, I probably jumped to conclusions. You look so close, and you played with each other like lovers. As friends, we're great friends, and the girls like both her and Sabrina. The girls walked in and Paisley was dragged into their room to watch them put on a little fashion show. After dinner, Paisley and I sat together in the living room with glasses of wine. How did you start playing again? She asked. I don't know. I'm no different from you, Paisley. I also had dreams and ambitions. I also wanted to conquer the world. I met Daisy, and we hit it off. The rest, as they say, is history. Why did you call your album That's What They Should Sound Like? Because, as I told you many times, I didn't like what you did to them. They were never meant to be pop songs, but we both know we have to make them commercial or they won't sell. Who cares? I'd rather have an album that doesn't sell well and maintain my integrity than sell out and have a hit. So you think I've sold out? Yes, in a way. You fell for Steve's tricks. They would still be living on benefits in Kelburn if it weren't for your talent and my songs. She nodded. Yes, they are idiots. Good musicians, but idiots. I don't know what they're thinking about, substances and alcohol. You got carried away with substances, she said, shuddering as a tremor ran through her body. It was a little, nothing serious. But yes, I tried it. Everyone does it, right? I shrugged. I don't know, maybe. Are you clean now? Yes, I haven't used it for some time. She saw my dissatisfied expression and added, Don't judge me, Jake. You experimented once too. I didn't judge, I was just worried. As I poured more wine, I asked, So what does the group do now? We've got a couple of shows in Auckland next week and one in Christchurch the week after. After that, it's up in the air unless we find something else to justify our trip. So what's next? Mushroom wants us to go back into the studio. We signed a two-album deal. Do you have any songs? No, we have nothing. Steve and the guys are useless. What about your old songs? I asked. I don't know. A couple might be okay, but I'll have to rewrite them, try to adapt them to the group and make them more modern. She looked at me with a question in her eyes. Do you have any new ones? What, you're going to steal them? She laughed maliciously. No, smart guy, I was just curious. She twisted her smile teasingly. Although, since you mentioned it, maybe we'll actually take them. While we were drinking wine, she said, come on, play them for me. Come back tomorrow. Daisy will be here, and you can actually hear them. They sound better when she sings them. Yeah, she has a really nice voice. It goes great with yours. We finished the wine. She snuggled up to me, made herself comfortable, and hobbled off. I could stay the night. You must be as excited as I am. I looked at her in disbelief. Paisley. Don't tell me or make me believe that you didn't sleep with anyone while you were on tour. She glared back at me. And you, Jake? There are a lot of single moms here. You probably slept with everyone, right? 
No, I sure as hell did not. Call me a fool, but our marriage is not officially over yet. I kept my promise. A thin smile crept at the corners of her lips. If I believe you, why don't you believe me? Jake, I promise you I didn't sleep with anyone. I was foolishly hoping that we could work things out in the end. Okay, your point is clear, but that doesn't change anything right now. I'd rather not raise the girl's hopes. They're just getting used to having you around again. You'll probably be leaving again in a week, and then they'll be shattered again. Jake, I'm not here just for the girls. While I was away, I realized that I love you. I need you in my life. I don't know, Paisley. I love you too, but I can't live the way we lived before. I don't want it to be like last time. Yes, I'll have to go away for a while, but if we schedule the album recording around the school holidays, we could go as a family. We can't go away for a few months. Yeah, we could go on a couple of trips, but if it's like last year, you'll be gone again forever. Sorry, Paisley, it's bad for the girls. It took me a long time to calm them down after you left. Jake, there must be a way to make this possible. There are thousands of couples around the world where one partner travels for work. It's okay to travel a little, but not the way you want. You want to lead a double life, go on tour for God knows how long, and then come back and play happy family for a few days before flying off to God knows where again. She looked disappointed. She had something to say, but, for some reason, remained silent. Standing up, she sighed. I better go. Can I see the girls tomorrow? I could pick them up from school. Of course. Just call your mom and tell her. Over the next week, Paisley spent more and more time at home. It was difficult for me because I was losing my personal battle. She was as beautiful as ever and had also grown emotionally. She was witty and charming. Every night after the girls went to bed, we would snuggle up on the couch. It was difficult for me to keep my distance, especially because she tried so hard to worm her way back into my life. Our conversations changed too. Now we were talking about the future. Jake, I can't continue living with Lily. I need my own house. I've been looking, but God, it's so expensive. I'm not sure I can buy it. She was looking for a reason, and I understood that. Paisley, you could move here. We have a spare bedroom. Maybe that could work. Thank you, but no. I can't do this. I love you. I want to be with you. Living platonically is not an option for me. This was the moment of truth. Paisley, I'm not sure. What if this doesn't work? You're leaving again next week. Darling, I'm only going away for six days. I'll be back before you get bored. Her pleading look softened my heart as she added, Jake, what's the worst that can happen? We'll try again, and if it doesn't work, then we'll do as you say and go our separate ways. I couldn't object. I knew this was exactly what I wanted. Our lives had entered a period of absolute bliss. She was right. I was excited, and so was she. When the girls woke up that morning to find Paisley in her bed, they were just as happy as we were. They also wanted the family to be reunited. Another bonus was that Daisy, Sabrina, and Paisley really became close friends. Our jam sessions and rehearsals turned into a big sing-along, with both Hannah and Lee participating and never being left out. When Paisley heard my new songs, she was delighted. Oh my God, Jake, these might be the best songs you've ever written. Daisy agreed. Yeah, I said the same thing. They're great, huh? Yes, God, dear, they are beautiful. I can imagine how we will perform them. No matter how it is, I answered sharply. They all laughed. Told you so, Paisley laughed, winking at Daisy. Paisley disappeared from a gig in Auckland. The girls' mood changes scared me, but when Paisley returned three days later, they soon came to their senses. The fact that she was coming and going every few days for the next couple of weeks didn't help. They were afraid that Paisley would disappear from their lives forever. It was hard not to notice the stress Paisley was feeling. The record label was putting pressure on her to return to the studio. Their problem was that they only had a few old Paisley songs. I saw her sadness. She became silent and withdrawn. 
I watched her night after night, guitar and notebook in her hands, trying to write something. When she returned from band rehearsals, she was beyond irritable. Damn, these guys are useless. They don't know anything about songwriting. Watching her struggle to write something, I took pity on her. I took my guitar and entered the music room where she was unsuccessfully trying to write. She raised her head when she saw me. What are you doing? I'll try to help you write something. It hurts me to listen to what you're playing. She laughed. Ha, huh, come on, show me what you can do. I sat down, tuned my guitar, and said, Okay, show me what you've got. She gave me the first couple of lines she had. I listened to the words, changed a couple in my mind, and as she played, I sang my version. Her face broke into a smile, and she began to sing along. As she sang, she found a few more words, and then I found a couple more lines. The second time we tried it, I let her sing and play. When she played the rhythm, it freed me up to find the melody line on the guitar. Within an hour, we had a new song. I felt a rush of pride when she said, Oh my God, Jake, this is amazing. I don't know how you do it. We worked every night for a week, and by the end of the week, we had six songs, something she could offer Mushroom, something that would give them some space. Over the next few weeks, we continued to work. We got out all the old Paisley songs. I even gave away an old song that I could never turn into something I liked, but this was a different mission. We were now writing pop songs rather than folk rock ballads. When Paisley brought them to the group, they were, of course, willing to take whatever they could get. This meant they entered a month-long rehearsal period, turning a group of songs into something the band could sell. I loved working with Paisley, it was like old times. Writing for her changed the way I approached it. I knew I was giving away my talent, but this time I didn't care. It was a gift I was happy to give. The record company was also pleased. In fact, they were so positive that they sent the band to Melbourne to record an album. The girls and I decided to go visit her. It turned out to be an incredible week. While Paisley was busy in the studio, Hannah, Lee, and I spent our days exploring the city's wonderful galleries, museums, and, of course, with two little girls, shopping was a must. We spent the evenings having dinners and new excursions. Overall, it was an incredible week. Paisley slowly revealed the new personality that had been hidden inside the cocoon she created to cope with her feelings. Jake, it's so great to have you and the girls here with me, supporting me. It's just fantastic. I feel so free. Last time I only felt guilt. It was so hard. Now I feel like you're supporting me. Can you bring the girls to the studio? I'd like them to see what I'm doing. Yes, of course. They would be glad to. Can we come tomorrow? Yes, I will issue passes. They will be waiting for you at the entrance. The studio visit was truly impressive. Their equipment was incredible, 20 times larger than the studio where Daisy and I recorded our album. It was amazing. When we entered, we were ushered into the recording booth. Paisley was just singing backing vocals. The girls looked through the large glass into the recording booth. Paisley saw us and waved. If I was amazed, the girls were even more delighted. The control panel was huge, with many switches, knobs, sliders, and flashing lights. I could see the desire in their eyes to twist something. Hell, I felt the same way myself. Afterwards, Paisley came out to us, and we all hugged. Seeing the joy on Paisley's face, I also felt admiration. Even in our worst times, I still felt proud of her performances. I didn't like what they did with my songs, but it didn't detract from her performances. She was a fantastic singer, moreover, a great performer and artist. We returned home, and Paisley stayed behind. She still had three to four weeks of work. This time we stayed in touch. She called every evening, and the girls loved it. We video called several times. Paisley showed the girls the new outfits she bought for them. It was so nice not to feel anxious. Moreover, I missed her incredibly. Every night in bed, my heart yearned for her, for the smell of her skin, for the feeling of her softness. I missed her deeply and wanted her to come back. When she finally returned, it was a relief. The girls couldn't wait. 
A lot of it had to do with waiting for the new clothes Paisley had bought for them, but at the core was love and warmth. Paisley brought one surprise with her, tucked under her arm, a new album. She handed it to me. I took it from her outstretched hands, looking a little surprised. Beautiful, I said, admiring the cover. I read the credits inside and saw, in bold letters at the bottom, all songs written by Jake Mello. It stunned me. Why did you do that? You wrote them too. No, she said. These songs would never have appeared if it weren't for you. Without you, we would have nothing. They would never have been born. This is my way of saying thank you. Thanks, Paisley, but you didn't have to. I know, but I wanted to. It's not much for all the trouble I put you and our family through. Thank you for so much more than just songs. Nothing goes smoothly in such relationships. After the recording was completed, the next stage began. A new tour, concerts, interviews. She was away a lot, but after this burst of activity died down, she returned home and was at home most of the time. When the concerts were in New Zealand, we went with the whole family. We bought a small camper van and followed her around as a group of fans. I never really got along with the guys in the band. They were living the stupid rock star dream, blowing all their money, always broke. It could never be sustainable, not for them. Their desire and need for money, their constant need for a new show to keep creditors at bay, eventually destroyed their group. Paisley had conquered her dragon. She had a string of number one hits, so she could say no. She didn't care. We didn't need money, but they did. It was this need that destroyed the group. I came home one evening and found Paisley and the girls grouped together on the sofa, obviously crying. The girls' faces were also streaked with tears. Damn, what happened? I said, falling into Paisley's arms. The band, we broke up. Why? Lots of reasons. Mainly they wanted to go back to Australia to tour. I said no. I hugged her tightly. I'm sorry. She giggled in a slightly mocking tone. Really? I thought you'd be happy. No, I know how important the group was to you. You know I didn't like the guys, but I understand how important it was to you. I'm really sorry. Thank you, she whispered through her tears. This changed things a bit. She still received offers to perform, but now she needed to perform solo or find another group. Daisy and I also moved forward. We continued to play our little gigs around town, and as it started to spread, we were getting offers from afar. We evolved, and it grew out of jam sessions and rehearsals in my music room. Paisley loved joining us when we were rehearsing, so that kind of morphed. Paisley's participation also encouraged Sabrina to join. It turned out she could sing. One evening, as we were preparing for the Sunday session, Daisy suggested, Paisley, why don't you perform with us? You know all the songs, you add a special touch. Please join us. Paisley looked at me. Will this be okay? Of course. But if we're growing, then I think Sabrina should join the group too. Sabrina looked shocked. Is it true? Paisley hugged her. Certainly. And so we had a small group. Paisley, who had started playing cello, brought that element. Sabrina, who had always loved drums and percussion, brought a small drum kit, a bass drum, a snare drum, and some cymbals. This added another dimension to our performances. Of course, having a famous singer in the group helped a lot. Paisley, being the person she was, obviously wanted more, and it didn't take long before she really became the front woman and the rest of us became the support. Our performances became increasingly popular. We regularly had full houses at the Garden Bar, and other establishments began to put us in line for reservations. This allowed us to raise prices. I dreaded the day when Daisy would finish her studies at the Polytechnic Institute. We often talked about how much she looked forward to returning to Gisborne. The day came, and I was excited but also sad for her. The small group had become such an important part of our lives that it would be sad to see it end. Paisley threw a big party to celebrate Daisy's graduation. There were many friends and children, a barbecue, and lots of drinks. It was a wonderful day. Later in the evening, when the crowd had cleared, it was just Sabrina, Daisy, Paisley, and me. 
So, when are you going to come home? I asked. Daisy shrugged. I'm not sure. I'll come back. Sabrina has a cool job in Tamaki Makoro. We have an apartment, and well, we have a band. I mean, if you don't want to continue, that's fine, but Sab and I like it. You're not going anywhere, Paisley replied sharply. Damn, I love the band. This is the most fun I've ever had. Everyone looked at me. Hey, I didn't want you to leave. I love the band too. The birth of our third child was completely unexpected, but fortunately, it was a boy. I was tired of being in the minority among women. This change altered everything once again. Paisley had to cut back on travel, no more big concerts for a while, but it gave us time together as a family. What do you think of this story? Which part did you like more? To be honest, I thought Jake didn't like himself and sacrificed his own happiness for the sake of his children, and I didn't like Paisley at all as a character, mother and wife. Although that's just my personal opinion. Write your stories in the comments and see you soon.